Hi, it's me, Lori Milandicho from BSA 2106 and I am here to explain the instances where there is a vitiation of contract but I am just going to mention four articles under the new civil code of the Philippines. The scope of this video is Article 30 and 31, Article 13 and 35, Article 13 and 37, and Article 13 and 38. So, let's get started. Here, sign this. This is the sum of amount that you owe me. Don't worry, this is the exact amount. I won't call you. Your land is no mine. This scenario is inspired to Andrea Dumasug versus Felix Modelo case and we can apply Article 1331. It states that in order that mistake may invalidate consent, it should refer to the substance of the thing which is the object of the contract or to those conditions which have principally moved one or both parties to enter into the contract. Mistake as to the identity or quality of one of the parties will vitiate consent only when such identity or qualifications have been the principal cause of the contract. A simple mistake of account shall give rise to correction. First, let us define what is a mistake or error. It is the false notion of the thing or fact material to the contract. It can be mistake of the object, which must refer to the substance of the thing to make the contract voidable. It can also be towards the person the consenting party is contracting with. It must not only be by the name of that person, but also on the characteristics of that party which may concern the confidence and trust of the other. Mistake of fact may be due to negligence or lack of knowledge. It must be the principal cause why a person enters into the contract. Hence, not all mistake can vitiate the consent and make the contract voidable. If the mistake is simple, the contract is not voidable because it does not affect the essential requisites of the contract. However, if the mistake is gross, the person who committed it cannot avoid the liability on the grounds of mistake. In the short skit earlier, it is an example of mistake of fact or the mistake as to the nature of the contract because the girl cannot read and write. Had she truly understood the contents of that contract, she would not have accepted it nor authenticated it with her mark. <laughs> when one of the contracting parties is compelled by a reasonable and well-grounded fear of an imminent and grave evil upon his person or property or upon the person or property of his spouse, descendants, or ascendants to give his consent. To determine the degree of intimidation, the age, sex, and condition of the person shall be borne in mind. A threat to enforce one's claim through competent authority, if the claim is just or legal, does not vitiate consent. This article mentioned violence and intimidation, and I will discuss the difference between these two. First, we have the violence. It happens when there is a physical force involved. It must be serious or irresistible. Example would be being hit by a paddle when you refuse to give your consent. On the other hand, intimidation. There are requisites that must be present for intimidation to vitiate the consent. First, it must produce reasonable and well-grounded fear. So, reasonable fear means that fear must commensurate the threat. Second, it must be imminent or grave. Third, it must be upon his person or property or that of his spouse, descendants, or ascendants. Fourth, it must be the reason why she enters into the contract. Now, these four requisites are present in the situation we have earlier. Fear is obvious, grave because a gun was pointed at her, it is upon his person or property or that of his spouse, descendants, or ascendants because she will be dead as well as her family if she refused to give consent. And lastly, if the intimidation is not present, she would not have given her consent to enter into the contract. If you can pay for your rent by this week, I have to kick you out. I'm sorry. Can I borrow some money? Please, you're my only hope. We don't even have food to eat. What? But you already asked money last week. You know what? Why don't you just sell your gold ring to me? But my husband gave this to me before he... 
already died. So, look at your baby. Would you trade the baby's health for some material thing? Okay, I will sell this to you for 12,000 pesos. 8,000. Take it or leave it. This clearly depicts undue influence. There is undue influence when a person takes improper advantage of his power over the will of another, depriving the latter of a reasonable freedom of choice. The following circumstances shall be considered. The confidential, family, spiritual, and other relations between the parties or the fact that the person alleged to have been unduly influenced was suffering from mental weakness or was ignorant or in financial distress. This was stated in Article 1337. But wait, when does undue influence occur? It occurs when one party of a transaction is able to influence the decisions of another party in that transaction. It gives one party an advantage over the other. But the influence must be improper or undue for it to avoid the contract because mere general or reasonable influence is not sufficient. There are circumstances which must uh, determine the existence of undue influence and that is the confidential, family, spiritual and other relations between the parties, mental weakness, ignorance, and financial distress. In our skit earlier, it was an example of financial distress. Why? Because the woman does not really want to sell her ring because it has sentimental value. But due to her financial condition, she is compelled to sell it. The sale can be avoided on the grounds of undue influence. Hi, I heard you're looking for some Louis Vuitton items. I have a phone case here. This is original, I swear. You won't regret this. How much? Well, it's originally priced at 260,000 pesos, but since we're friends, I'll give this to you for 250,000 pesos only. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Sure, I'll buy that. A few moments later. Oh, I'm so excited for this. What? This is fake. The stitches should be perfect. But what is this? Oh, never experienced this before? Well, you can actually annul the sale on the grounds of fraud. Article 1338 states that there is fraud when through insidious words or machination of one of the contracting parties, the other is induced to enter into a contract which without them, he would not have agreed to. This article does not define fraud. It merely states that there is fraud when a party is induced to enter into a contract through insidious words or machination of another. Fraud is every kind of deception or misrepresentation is schemed or designed to lead a party into substantial mistake or error and relying thereon, he commit an act that leads to his damage or prejudice. Fraud is a deception to gain consent without committing estafa or felony. However, it must be proved with clear and convincing evidence and not mere preponderance of evidence. In order that fraud may annul consent, there must be concealment or misrepresentation of a material fact with the knowledge of its falsity. So in our example, the seller is perfectly knowledgeable that her products are fake, but she concealed that fact to the buyer. Second, it must be serious. Third, it must have been employed by only one contracting party. Fourth, it must have been made in bad faith or with the intent to deceive the other party who have no knowledge of the fraud. So it was obvious that the seller is trying to deceive the buyer. Lastly, it must have induced the consent of the other contracting party and it must be alleged and proved with convincing evidence. So in this case, it can be solved when they hire a person who knows what is fake and what is real. So that would be the end of this video. Just a friendly reminder, if anything of this happens to you in real life, just know that the law can actually protect you, so don't hesitate to ask for help. That would be all. Thank you for watching.